Hi guys, Jonathan here once more with three apparently identical guns and I'm using the term guns advisedly because two of these are not in fact rifles or rifle muskets uh, which is the term at the time. The time being the 1850s and these actually relate to uh, a very important but also very sad and difficult uh, period of uh, British colonial um, history and that is the what's traditionally called the Indian Mutiny or the Indian Rebellion. Um, there are the, the most, most famous kind of technological arms connection to that event or that, uh, that incident, that conflict, is the cartridge. Famously, and I think we can categorically say that there was in fact uh, animal fat that was problematic in religious and cultural terms uh, for, for Indians in that paper cartridge. Issues about when they were actually issued uh, and how the, the government responded to that, um, I'm not going to get into here. There are arguments on, on both sides. But it's a fact that one of the triggers for the Indian Rebellion was the greased cartridge that was due to be issued with the Patton 1853 rifle musket, which had yet to actually see um, issue into the hands of the troops, at least. I think we can say that. That is this here, Patton 1853, or P53 rifle, or rifle musket, or rifled musket, depending on your, well, depending on, on the source, actually. And this is one of our sealed patterns that we're very fortunate to have here at the armories. So as well as being in basically pristine condition, it has the literal seal of approval, or two of them, in fact, and the seal of the Master General of the Ordnance is the, is the important one, on the butt. And it also has inscribed on there what sealed pattern this actually is, because there were, there were more than one. This is for a P53 that was shortened in the butt by one inch after a lot of tedious committee meetings, which if you come to the archive, you can use the, the reference that's on here, go and look that up and learn why it was they shortened the butt by an inch. And it was to do with, I guess, early ergonomic considerations for soldiers of different sizes. Uh, ultimately, we'd go to uh, optional length butts on service rifles. Um, but that's kind of by the by. But it is important that we compare what's in on the table in front of me with this. Um, most obviously, the P53 rifle required a full-on rifle sight. So uh, at its lowest um, graduation, it's, it's flat and then it's flip up and adjustable. It's so long, I have to be careful not to, not to clout anything with it. Um, and you slide, you, you know how these tangent sights work, and then the very top, um, which I think at least from 1850, 56, was a thousand yards, that very top notch there, which of course means you're shooting almost like an archer at very long range. You won't hit a man, but you will hit a baggage train or whatever it is you're trying to harass or, or cause problems for. Very capable, very important historical British rifle. Um, I have missed out the, the, the middle step of the sighting system, which is that you, you have ramps here that allow you to adjust this uh, notch as well. And then the other very key point, if I can uh, point the muzzle toward the camera without <laughs> terrifying anybody. Um, and it may not show up that well. We might, we'll get you close up if we need to. There's rifling in the board because that's what makes a rifle a rifle. Spiral groove spins the bullet for stability and therefore for accuracy. Um, three grooves to, uh, on this, this type, very shallow because they're using the mini A pattern or mini A type bullet, not pattern, because there are different patterns. The Pritchett bullet is the perhaps the most famous for, for this. Uh, shallow rifling because you have to load it essentially like a musket ball without jamming it into the grooves because when you fire it, that's when the lead expands at the base and grips the rifling. So you can't have deep, obvious rifling, but it is there and it is critical to reaching out beyond, well, 100 yards really. 100 yards being the standard sort of effective range of a smoothbore musket. Now, what we're really here to look at are these two. So this one is the pattern 1858 
uh, musket for, quote, native infantry. And right away, now that I've been going on about sites, you can probably see this has a much simplified rear sight. So if I try to show you that, it is just a notch. It's very similar to the sight on the previous, or what would have still been standard issue at the time uh, for Indian regiments, uh, or, uh, regiments of the British um, Indian Army. The P-42, percussion musket, smooth bore. It's just a U-shape. It does have a notch in the bottom for, for slightly finer aiming. Um, and things like this are more accurate than people give them credit for, but they're really not that capable beyond 100 yards. And that's significant. Um, well, the other bit I need to show you. So down the bore, it is in fact smooth bore. So that relatively small amount of metal that allows you to have the lands of the, of the rifling, uh, the lands being the, 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 up, the uppy bit, <laughs> <laughs> and the grooves being the, the, well, the grooves. All they did for the pattern 1858 was take a standard P53 barrel and ream out the rifling. So it's now a smoothbore musket. So you, what you've done is create essentially a P42 musket that looks like a P53 rifle. Now, if you know your guns, you'll, you'll know that what you've given the indigenous troops is a far less capable weapon. So it's, you know, the, the P-53, in terms of some sort of effective fire, is 10 times more accurate <laughs> than this thing. This is essentially Brown Bess. We've gone back to Brown Bess. Now, why have we done that? Well, you can probably guess it's, it's essentially, to in video game language, nerf the weapons of the local troops so that they can't turn them against their masters, essentially, as happened in the Indian Mutiny slash Indian Rebellion. Um, so a, a really significant, uh, very small detail if, you know, for, for most people at the time and, and even perhaps today if you're just looking at these things, but it speaks volumes to the attitude to the Indian Army in the immediate aftermath of that event. Now that's not the whole story. Um, incidentally, this is also a sealed pattern. And before I continue, I will show you. Now, full disclosure, shocking bit of museum practice before uh, things were properly established as they now are, is that museums or, or collections would sometimes nail numbers into objects, which is absolutely horrific uh, by any modern measure. Um, for display, we will typically have these carefully removed. Um, but this, this has never been on display. This still has its various things nailed into it. So I just wanted to point that out because I know people will ask and we are upfront about these things. Um, and needless to say, I didn't do it. <laughs> um, what I wanted to point out though is this is also a seal pattern. Um, so you will come across or you'll see on the, market, on the uh, antiques market this, this pattern of weapon. What you won't probably see is the seal pattern version of it. So we're, we're very fortunate to have I'd say the best collection of P-53 Enfield family weapons um, probably anywhere in the world. But it makes sense. This collection came from the Tower of London and the factory at Enfield uh, where these things were mostly made. And then on the buttstock, it actually says, first pattern, smooth bore musket. You'll notice they're qualifying the word musket there because very technically, uh, the best kind of technically, <laughs> uh, a musket is just a military long arm that takes a bayonet. Um, now, they're nearly always smooth bore, so you don't usually have to qualify smooth bore, but they have done that here, as if to emphasize they're giving these people something less capable. <laughs> and uh, 0.656 is on there. That's the caliber. That's the resulting caliber when you bore a 577 rifle out to a musket bore. 656. And then you've got approved 19th of May. 58. That's the date that it was officially approved. Would have taken a bit of time to see introduction. And then finally, that fractional number is, again, how you go and look this up in the archive. Um, so as a, as a historical item, uh, this, this is like an archive item and a 3D object all in one, as are all of the sealed patterns, which is why we like them so much. So the reason I say the story isn't over yet is that there's a second pattern of 
native infantry musket, which is the 1859. Now, I'm not great at maths, but that's quite soon after 1858. And that's because, boring out the barrel, it was thought, I don't know if there was any actual uh, negative outcome from this, made the walls of the barrel too thin for that 656 caliber. So for the second go at, at keeping rifles out of the hands of your troops, they went with a, a, a thicker walled barrel that they were happy with in terms of pressure and proof and all of that. It meant manufacturing new barrels, but you know that, that was a cost they were willing to bear. You're still making savings on the stocking, the lock, the furniture, barrel bands and so forth. Um, so it's still quite an economical thing to make. And in terms of making barrels, once you've set up the machinery to do it, you're not having to remount as, uh, sorry, you're not having to rifle as many of your barrels. So yeah, once you've set up to manufacture it, you're not really losing out too badly. Now, that's not the only change they made, interestingly. So the rear sight stays the same. But the front sight turns into a little monopoly house, <laughs> how I tend to think of it. Some people have referred to it as a dog kennel. Um, Peter Smithhurst, uh, our cura curator emeritus, who is Mr. P53, he, he, he knows all about these. Uh, incidentally, check out his Osprey book and check out his thesis, which is available online. We can link to that in the description. Um, but they have done away with what was the same front sight as the P53, so a blocky base with a, a truncated blade as your front sight, and they've replaced it with a simple faceted block. Now that is, so, so the, the both sights have a block, and that is the mounting point for the bayonet. I haven't got any bayonets out for these because I don't want to mark up the barrels by trying to fit a bayonet to these very important, unique items, uh, but it's a standard socket bayonet, goes over that block and locks in, and then whatever sight on top of that doesn't really matter. You can choose whatever you'd like. And they've gone for a simple angle like that. Now, we don't have documentation on why they did that, or at least we haven't found it. Um, I assume it's to ease production. It's easier to make a, a simple house-shaped block than it is to uh, file, take the time to file a blade. And you don't need a precision blade because you haven't got a precision rear sight and you haven't got any rifling, so why bother? So that's the pattern 1859. So if you ever do come across what looks like a P53 but doesn't have a proper sight on it, chances are it's either a P58 or a P59. That's still not the whole story because these are not the only smoothbore members of the Enfield family. Um, the Irish Constabulary carbine was also smoothbore, the pattern 1858, different pattern 1858. Uh, all of these Pattern designations are qualified by a name, and that's the Irish Constabulary Carbine. Now, I have to, I don't, we don't know this for sure, um, but I assume that that was also to do with, it may have been to do with worries of constabulary um, officers having their weapon taken from them in the event of an insurrection or something. Getting a bit speculative there, but the fact is, by all rights, they probably should have had a rifled carbine, but they issued them a smoothbore one, and there are various others. So th this would have been issued to um, Indian Army soldiers, to uh, sepoys. There were, sh just like the, f the proper <laughs> P-53, there were shorter versions, sergeant's fusils, um, cavalry carbines, you name it, the full family, but in smoothbore. So I, th I think that's a, a really fascinating bit of history and shows how you know, weapons can, you know, they're more than just weapons, they're always more than just weapons. They are, they're tools, they're historical documents, and they are echoes of empire. As always, guys, thank you very much for watching. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, you can actually, if you'd like to, donate to us. Uh, we have a, if you check out the website, there's a way to do that. Um, we just mainly want you to <laughs> subscribe and like and do all of that YouTube stuff. Um, you can also check out our, as well as the website, our social media channels. Uh, they're all linked from the website anyway. Um, and very importantly, we'd like you to visit us. Um, we are a museum at the end of the day, or, well, several museums, Tower of London, Fort Nelson, and here in Leeds. So if you're in the UK, um, and even if you're not, if you're on vacation or something, please do come and see us. We'd love to see you. Thanks a lot.